Welcome everyone to this evening's webinar, Proper Feeding of Ewes During Breeding and Pregnancy. We're very pleased tonight to have three excellent presenters with us, Dr. Rodney Cott, Dr. Lisa Serber, and Dr. Reed Redden. My name is Jay Parsons. I'll serve as the organizer and moderator for this evening's event. This webinar is being offered by the American Sheep Industry Association in conjunction with its Rebuild the Sheep Industry Initiative with funding support from the National Sheep Industry Improvement Center. This evening's webinar will be recorded. A lot of you have emailed me and asked me that. It will be recorded and will be made available for later viewing. All of the people who registered for the event will receive a follow-up email in two to three days thanking you for your participation and providing a link to this webinar recording. So if you're unable to stay for the duration of the webinar, uh, you can view that rest of it later at your leisure. And if you know of anybody who uh, wanted to attend the webinar but was unable to do it live this evening, uh, feel free to share that link with them and they can watch it later also. If you misplaced the email that's sent to you or delete it, um, there will also be a link placed on the American Sheep Industry website and uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it's sheepusa.org. Um, and you can look for that in the Rebuild the Sheep Industry materials. We'd like this evening's program to be as interactive as possible. Uh, we're going to do that in a couple of ways. Uh, one of the ways I would like to do that here to start with is uh, to kick things off with a polling question for you. You all should have up on your screen right now a question asking you how much experience do you have raising sheep? Um, the choices are little or none, which would be zero to two years experience, a fair amount, three to ten years experience, and quite a bit, anything over ten. This question will help our presenters tailor their uh, talk and some of their comments uh, towards the audience a little better. Looks like most of you have voted. So I'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results with you. Okay, you see we have uh, both ends of the spectrum represented and just a few in the middle. So uh, majority of you have quite a bit of experience um, and a few of you have little or none. Okay, I'd like to follow this up with one more polling question um, for our presenters, give them an idea of what kind of flock size folks have out there. So how many ewes do you currently manage? Very few or none, which would be 0 to 9 head. A small flock, 10 to 49 head. A decent sized mob of 50 to 249 head. Quite a few, 250 to 999, or a whole bunch, anything over a thousand. I should comment that we have a pretty diverse audience in terms of registration across the country, um, east as well as west. Um, so I'm expecting quite a few different flock sizes here. Let me share with you our results. Okay, most of you are underneath that 250 uh, head range. Um, looks like 10 to uh, 49 head is the most common. So thank you for participating in that. Um, the second way that we'd like to invite you to participate in this evening's event is by asking questions. Uh, some of you have submitted some questions on the registration form, and those have been passed on to our speakers uh, to hopefully address some of those uh, during the talk. Um, but you can also submit questions during the webinar, and there's two ways you can do that. One of them is the question box that you have on your um, dashboard. You can type a question in there at any time. I will be monitoring that throughout the broadcast, and there will likely be a, uh, two to three points um, during the presentation where we can pause and perhaps answer some of those questions at the, at the time that material is being addressed. 
Um, if your question is not answered during the broadcast, uh, we can bring it up. Uh, we'll also go through those at the end in our Q&A session. The uh, second way that you can uh, ask a question is to raise your hand. Um, and assuming that you are connected to your um, uh, computer with a microphone, I can give you that microphone and you can ask your question live uh, to the presenters and interact with them that way. Uh, we are going to save those questions for the end so that we aren't constantly passing the mic around while the uh, presenters are trying to work their way through slides. Um, but that's a, another way for you to interact with them tonight. Uh, one final comment on the interaction piece, and that is when you do exit the uh, webinar, uh, we do have a short exit poll for um, you to um, fill out. It shouldn't take more than a minute. It's mainly just two quick questions on uh, tonight's webinar, and then three quick questions on future webinars in terms of the time that they are offered and um, and the topics that we would cover um, so that we can plan those best to, to meet our audience needs. So, With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our uh, speakers. we got Dr. Rodney Cott, Extension Sheep Specialist from Montana State University, and Dr. Lisa Serber, Research Scientist, also at Montana State University, and Dr. Reed Redden, Sheep Extension Specialist at North Dakota State University. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rodney Cott, to lead us off with his uh, presentation. And Rodney, you should have the screen to you. Okay, I can ever, Jay, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. It's coming. Okay, let me do it this way. There we can see it now. It. We can see okay. it now. Uh, I'm not going to use the slide presentation today because the screen moved kind of slow. Uh, so I'm just going to use the desktop and, and go through the screen. Uh, we welcome you. We're going to try to address everything. Uh, as you go through, there's, there's no bad questions. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to type it in. We may you know, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, I don't think we have a limit. Uh, but kind of to go over the general theme of this this talk, today is, is going to be on you nutrition. And I am trying to change the screen. There we go. We should change. We should have a little bit in just a second. Hopefully it's coming. We're going to we're going to try to go through this a little quick. Uh, the goal of this talk, and if we look at nutrition, you know, we try to match the forages to the sheep, and then maybe supplement them in any any manner that we can, but. But the goal of any nutrition program is to maximize the use of our our forages. I'm trying to get the screen to move here again. My screen is Paul. Well, it's gone. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to go through a number of things. We're going to go through the nutrient requirements, and that's the first thing in any nutrition program that we have is to, map, to, to follow those nutrient requirements. Then the problem that we get into in a, in a nutritional program is that not everything follows the rule. And so we have to modify those nutrient requirements based on the body composition of the animal. And to do that, we have to do, use some measure of figuring out what body condition is. And then 
the last thing we're going to go through, one of the things we're going to go through is, is focus on the U and focus on the periods of the nutrition cycle. We're going to talk about the breeding period. We're going to talk about flushing. Then we're going to focus on the first part of pregnancy. If we talk about nutrition, probably that's the least important. And then we get into the last third of pregnancy when things go. But that's a subject for a whole new, whole different talk is, is that. We're also going to talk a little bit about forage testing. Uh, when we get into drought situations, forage, forage testing becomes extremely important. And then a little bit of management or, or a little bit of weaning management. So those are the things. Uh, the first topic is to talk about, Jay, why don't you turn the speaker over to Reed now. And the first thing that we need to talk about is uh, meeting the nutrient needs of the animal. And that's, that's extremely important. Reed, you there? I am. I am. So hopefully the audience is able to see the slides here. Uh, one of the things that we would like to cover for you is, is to talk about some optimum feeding strategies. And one of the first things that we need to realize is uh, sheep do not require any one specific feed. And it's actually the, the nutrients within the feed that are the most important. You there, Reed? I am, but I'm having difficulty with it. Yeah. So you should be able to see now, I believe it's going to load here relatively shortly, but uh, this is the, the book that most of us use now. It's a, it's a new a new publication called The Nutrient Requirements of Small Ruminants. It was published in 2002. Uh, this, this new edition is, has some new updated things for sheep, but it also includes goats, cervids, and New World camelids. Uh, Rodney was so kind to take a picture of this on his, on his desk that we moved into his office for you. And I'll remind you, it was quite a heavy desk, Rodney. Um, but uh, this, this newer edition is something that's prepared um, by, by some academic types, and it really refines some things, but it's probably not something that's targeted for the sheep producer. Um, actually, the 1985 edition has a lot of usefulness to it, and it, um, it is sold individually, but it also a large portion of it is within the sheep production handbook. And so if I'm going to recommend anyone to get some materials to read up on nutrition, uh, to get the nutrient requirements that we're going to talk about in a, just, just shortly after this, and to also get a lot of other information, I would recommend this, this book as a resource for sheep producers. So within the new NRC, uh, they kind of lay out the things that we normally look at when we're developing the nutrient demands for the sheep. Um, they break it down by the U, by her body size. Uh, hopefully the screen is up now, and you'll see on the class. And so on the left side, you should see mature U's. Um, and then there's maintenance, breeding, and some other categories that I'll talk about in just a second. But it also breaks them down by body size. Uh, our audience is quite diverse, I'm sure. And so there's more than likely some uh, U's that are around at their mature weights, 100 pounds. And there's some that may be close to 200 pounds. And so this book actually it helps with that. Uh, it is all in scientific units, so it is in kilograms and grams and not in pounds, which uh, we may have to convert over. Uh, but it's not too difficult of an issue. Uh, within it, it talks about the daily dry matter intake that our animals need. Um, I'll talk about that some in a minute. But it also covers the main points, which is energy and protein. And you see the two arrows are pointing to those. Uh, we commonly use TDN, which stands for Total Digestible Nutrients, or we may also use ME, which stands for Metabolizable Energy. And I'm sure most, most all of you are familiar with CP, which stands for Crude Protein. One of the new things that the new uh, book does have is that it does not give just one crude protein value, and it actually breaks it down by the percent UIP, which is a 
undegradable intake protein. Uh, and for the most part, you're just going to focus on the, the 20 percent because most of our feedstuffs, uh, if they're of a grass-based, you know, so if it's grass or hay, it's going to be probably be around that 20 percent UIP level. So that's where we would get our crude protein uh, requirements. Uh, distiller's grains would be one option that's at a higher rate at about 20 percent UIP. And then the 60 percent level is probably more uh, applicable to some of our animal products, so fish meal, feather meal, meat and bone meal. Uh, we, we commonly always talk about crude protein because of the fact that it's probably the most expensive component to a lot of our feeds, although with the drought and a number of other things going on, some of our energy components are getting quite expensive as well. So as, as we look into U nutrient requirements, uh, the two main ones are energy and protein. Uh, we are going to focus a little bit on dry matter, uh, just just so that we know the amount that we're feeding to the U. Uh, the one point, or the two main points, is the minerals and vitamins that we are not going to cover. Uh, this is something that would take a lot more time than we have available, and uh, these vitamins and minerals are 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 a key point. They're going to vary quite a bit, and I would encourage you to to seek more information after this webinar to get some specifics about vitamins and minerals. So I have a, a, a graph here, or a figure that I like to use. And on the x-axis, hopefully you can see this graph now, but on the x-axis it has um, 0 to 12 months. And so when I like to think about feeding use or providing nutrient requirements, I like to think about it on a 12-month scale because most often our use are are lambing once a year. Uh, this would not be applicable to an accelerated lambing system, and we'll leave that for a later audience as well. But if we think about a 12 month, um, what I start is from, from time zero would be the time that we wean the lambs. So from the time of weeding to breeding, we're at maintenance. Um, in a ewe, in this, in this figure, this is a rather large ewe at 175 pounds, in maintenance for the dry matter intake or her dry matter intake requirements is actually less than three pounds. But that changes quite abruptly. Um, Rodney will discuss flushing in a short minute, but flushing uh, which would occur right before breeding, we actually need to increase the amount of dry matter intake to the ewe by 45%. Um, after we've moved into the breeding period, our nutrient requirements for the ewe drops off quite a bit. Uh, the, those requirements drop back down to just about 10% above maintenance. And they remain there until we get into late gestation, the last 45 uh, or 50 days of gestation. So at this point, our, the use requirements again jump back up. It's a 45% increase above maintenance um, for a U carrying a single. However, if that U has twins, her requirements are actually a little bit above that, but not uh, a large amount. Where we see a drastic increase in the requirements for a U is in lactation. So in lactation, uh, the ewe requires 95% more feed, almost twice what she needs to just maintain herself uh, during that peak lactation. And that's for a single. If the ewe has a twin, um, it's actually at 125% of that maintenance level. And so I like this graph because it gives you a nice figure and a way to think about providing nutrients to the ewe at the different time points throughout the year. Um, I also have this graph for, for TDN and crude protein, and I'm just going to kind of flip through these rather quickly. And what you'll notice is that we follow the same trend as we do for dry matter intake. Um, dry matter intake is in that graph is based off of a U consuming a forage-based diet that's typically around 50% TDN. And so as we see this chart build, and I hope that... Um, that our webinar is able to keep up with these animations here. Uh, but we see the relatively same trend. Uh, for TDN at a maintenance level, we're at 1.5 pounds per day. We have a 50% increase at flushing and late gestation, uh, whereas that would be 80% for twins. Then during lactation, it's 130%, and then lactation with twins would be 170%. Um, crude protein, um, a very similar graph. And again, I'm just going to flip through all these for the sake of time. Uh, but what we what we see in, in crude protein is is the same thing. It's just a little bit more, uh, 
a little bit higher level. So when we get into that lactation period, it's even higher, 250 percent. So these these requirements of the U are very very high, but we rarely do we actually feed to that amount. One key point about nutrient requirements that I'd like to touch upon that I get questions from sheep producers quite a bit about, and and the question is is how much crude protein do I need? And the answer that they always want is a percent, um, is a percent in the feed because that's what we normally talk about as feeds. However, as the figures above defined, animals require amounts and not so much just uh, percentages, but feed is expressed as in percentages. So this example, I like to use it, it's very, very simple. So for lambs, if a lamb needed a half a pound of crude protein per day to maximize the growth, we could feed that lamb two pounds total feed at 25 percent crude protein and meet its demands. Whereas if we fed it three pounds, it would need to be a 17 percent crude protein diet or if we fed it four pounds, it would only need to be a 12 percent crude protein. So hopefully that helps you think that percentages are for feed and animals require pounds and dry matter intake is the number one key factor that regulates what that percent needs to be. The only percentage that we really need to focus on is that the rumen microbes within the rumen, they need a certain percent and that percent is somewhere between six and eight percent crude protein so that they remain functional. Uh, we have a couple of figures here. So one is just a lamb, so you can kind of see the digestive tract where that rumen sits on the, the opposite side of the lamb. This comes out of the, the sheep industry, the sheep production manual, um, a, a really good figure. And then on the bottom figure, we see a cow's digestive system. So basically, if you divided everything by 10, you get a rough idea of the size of it. But that rumen is the, the first key area where most fermentation occurs. And that rumen population needs about, a, about well, let's just say 8% crude protein to maintain normal function. A couple, of, a couple more slides here to just kind of show you and, and help you think about feeding nutrients and not feed. And so in this one figure, say we needed to feed 10 pounds of TDN. Now this would probably be more applicable to cattle, but we like to use 10 pounds because it's easy to quantify and then we can see these feeds on a larger scale. But this 10 pounds of TDN, we would need 18 pounds of alfalfa because alfalfa is typically just above 50% TDN. Um, we could also feed uh, straw to get 10 pounds, but straw has a very low amount of TDN as a portion of the total feed, so we would actually need to feed 25 pounds of straw. And the most concentrated energy, or one of the most concentrated energy sources, would be corn. So corn, we would only have to feed 11 pounds um, to get our 10 pounds of TDN. One caution, though, as we're feeding corn and really starch-based diets, uh, we have to be concerned about overfeeding or, or acidosis, so we, we do need to adapt our animals slowly to these diets, and we wouldn't recommend a corn-based diet for you, maybe a lamb. Uh, crude protein is, is very similar to this. So if we wanted to feed one pound of crude protein, uh, that would need to be 5.5 pounds of alfalfa or only two pounds of soybean meal. But again, we're back to 25 pounds of straw just to get one pound of crude protein. And so this kind of shows you why we don't use straw a lot in sheep diets because they just can't consume enough of it um, to really get the, the impact that we need. And we can only feed a lot of straw in some of those, maybe that maintenance period or that early gestation where we don't need a lot of feed resources. So this is the, the last picture that I have or the last slide that I have uh, depicting this. But this kind of go back, goes back to that high lactation for 150 pound U. Um, they need about 0.9 pounds of crude protein. And we can get that from those same sources. So that would be essentially 12.5 pounds of corn or 28 pounds of straw or 5.6 pounds of alfalfa or even 2.1 pounds of soybean meal. And each of those have a dry matter percentage as well because uh, we're, we're only calculating what we need as a dry matter, not the amount of water that's in there. So help, hopefully that gives you an idea of how to think about feeding nutrients to animals and not feeds. Okay, the last point of this would be um, that optimum feeding strategies may not 
always involve meeting exact nutrient requirements of the ewe at each stage of production. And one of the reasons is is because if you see that lactation period, rarely do we have or can we get a ewe to eat enough during that time. And so one of the things that we often do is we use the ewe's body resources at those times of uh, what we call negative energy balance, where the ewe is growing or she's producing more milk uh, than what she can consume or the nutrients that she can consume. So in this graph you can see again a 12 month period, the way I like to kind of think about it from lambing to lambing. So from lambing during that lactation period she's going to actually lose body weight because she can't consume enough high quality feed to maintain body weight. Once we wean the lambs we're in that maintenance period and we can put that body weight back on. Um, the key question is how much can we afford that you to lose and then regain. And so the overall goal would then again always be to achieve a balance in body condition over an entire production cycle. So with that, I will um, let uh, Lisa talk to you just a, a bit about body composition. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to visit with you briefly here about talking about body condition scoring or how we can determine body composition. Body condition scoring is, is an excellent way to determine body composition or to assess nutrient status of our use. And Jay, Jay, it's, it's Rodney's screen. Yeah, you just need to hit show your screen. It should be, oh, Rodney's screen, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. We're sharing the same computers. So yeah, so. I switched it to Lisa. Hopefully the audience can figure out when, when I'm talking and when Rodney's talking. <laughs> Show my screen. Okay, so now everyone should see the, the horse and rider in the in the band sheet. Okay, so I think we can I think we can go on to the next slide and. We're. So we, we're not we seeing like your screen help. yet, though. There we go. Okay, we're good now? Yes. All right, thanks. Apologize for the... Uh, what are you seeing? The horse and rider. Target body score right now. Okay, so you're a little, you're a little behind me, okay. Apologize to the audience. We're having, us at MSU are having a little technical difficulties. We're, we're about a five or ten second uh, delay on the slide, so... You'll just have to bear with us. Um, you should be should be looking at a slide right now that has a graph and talking about our target body condition score. And you know, if our use read our, our textbooks that we've been talking about or our handbooks that we we've been talking about, you know, we'd like those we'd like that you to be at a body condition score of three. Um, that's you know about ideal body condition score, but it's probably pretty likely and maybe even economical that during certain times of the year that you is going to fall below that body condition score. So some of you may be asking what, what we're even talking about in terms of uh, body condition score. What does that mean? And uh, really kind of a textbook definition of body condition scoring is being able to estimate muscle and fat development on an animal. And we give those sheep a score of one to five. One being our emaciated or extremely thin you, and five being our roly-poly, uh, really obese you. Really yeah, we're we're really struggling with our with our visual aids, but um, we should be coming up on a slide that describes or gives you a better uh, picture of what body condition score. Hopefully, hopefully you can see this now. We have scores one through five on the screen. Are you looking at that, Jay? Okay, well, I'm just going to assume that that's where we're at. Yes, we're, we can see it fine now, so go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So, 
these, this, this particular slide um, really does a pretty good job of describing you know, what we're talking about. So on our condition score one, we're looking at a, a very thin U. She has no fat cover. Her loin muscle is uh, severely underdeveloped. Those, her spine feels sharp to your hand. The transverse process feels sharp, and you should be able to easily put your hand underneath it. Condition score two, things should feel a little smoother. You should feel a little bit more muscle. Um, the transverse process should be a little bit more rounded, a little bit more difficult to put your hand, kind of tuck your hand in underneath. Our ideal condition score three, you're seeing um, that spine being more smooth, more rounded. Um, that U has some moderate fat cover. The transverse process is smooth and rounded. And it becomes more difficult to palpate uh, underneath the transverse process. Um, with condition score four, you're going to feel, again, more, just generally more fat cover, harder to feel the bones. And under a five, you're not going to be able to feel just about anything because all you're feeling is fat. So when we get into we want to focus in on these scores two and three because typically that's where you're going to see the majority of your sheep during the production cycle. Um, the subtle differences between these two, again, I just want to emphasize that you know the spine and the transverse process is just going to be a little bit easier to palpate, you're going to feel a little uh, more sharp to the touch, easier to get your hand under than maybe a condition score three. So as we're, we're kind of moving along, um, areas on the sheep, and this will be coming on your screen in just a short second, areas to assess fat in sheep are, are described here. But typically when we're covering or when we're talking about uh, body condition, we're mostly focusing on, on area B, where we're feeling the spine, where we're feeling the transverse process. So those are the, that's the area that you're typically going to focus on maybe a little bit um, down the ribs, but uh, for the most part, we're focusing um, on area B. This next slide is, is an interesting slide. Um, this was some old photography done here at MSU from a number of years ago, but it's meant to illustrate really the differences um, between these two U's in terms of body condition score. The U on your left, is probably a body condition score two, and the U on the right is probably a body condition score three. These are or four, I should say. Um, it's fairly easy to visually determine that um, because these U's have very little wool on them. Um, the U on the left probably has just uh, lambed and is mobilizing a lot of nutrient reserves for uh, lactation and beginning to recover from lambing. And the U on the, the right, you know, she could possibly maybe not even lamb yet. So um, these pictures can be a little bit deceiving until you get your hands on the animal and feel those, um, feel the spine, feel the transverse processes. In this next slide, when it comes on your screen, we're looking at some wool sheep. And the changes or the, the, the differences between these U's are a little bit more subtle. The, you know, the U on the left, AU, um, you should be able to, to see that maybe the wool splits a little bit across her spine. You, could, you should be able, as a, as a trained uh, body condition scorer, or as a producer, you should be able to identify that that U is maybe a little bit on the thin side. And if you have a whole flock of those type of ewes, you're definitely not prepared for lambing, and you need to bump up uh, your feeding program. The ewe on the right is in much better condition. She may be a condition score three. She looks rounder. But again, having these sheep in the wool it make, certainly makes it more difficult to assess body condition score until you get your hands on them. I kind of wanted to visit with you a little bit, too, about um, 
maybe in terms of weight, being able to understand body condition score. And you should be coming, coming up on your screen shortly um, is a slide that really describes, um, in terms of weight, the difference in body condition score. Um, typically, in most Western white face sheep, a body condition score is about 20 pounds. And that would move 150 pound you up to 165 or 170 pounds. Um, to be a condition score four. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, body condition score quickly before Rodney moves into flushing. Um, some critical times that we should be thinking about using this tool um, certainly would be before breeding, probably four to six weeks before breeding, assessing that body condition score so you can make changes in your use before you get to breeding. Another critical time is uh, maybe a turnout or four to six weeks after lambing. You can do something about that you um, in terms of changing her nutrient status. And one of the other critical times is that weaning. Again, you can make some changes to those ewes before you get to more critical times in the production cycle. So I'm going to pass the microphone over to Rodney, and he's going to carry on with his discussion on flushing. Thank you. I think body condition score in a nutrition program is the most important thing we can do. Uh, if you talk about the old experience, I guess you don't have to be old to be old. You don't have to be old to be be very good, uh, but uh, you, you, you know, old, an experienced sheep producer, producer looks at body condition and kind of does it naturally without thinking about it. Less experienced producers, we talk about having them put their hand on the sheep and actually figuring out where, they're, where they are, and that could be the biggest tool you could use. We're going to go to flushing. Excuse me for the spelling. I changed flushing just before, and of course, I, everybody that knows me knows I don't spell very good. But flushing is what we're coming up to now. Breeding season is starting. Ewes are, are typically seasonally anestrous, so they should just about now be starting the cycle. If, you know, they cycle in cooler weather, and more particularly in decreasing daylight hours. So. You know, some sheep will be cycling. As we get in the bat west, our wool sheep probably aren't cycling until, you know, mid-September or whatever. So we should be right at the beginning of the breeding season in sheep. But if we talk about flushing, there's two things that we have. One is the body weight of sheep, and that's not really related to flushing, but nutrition has an effect on the body weight. And then the second one is the true flushing effect. If we look at body weight, it's coming. Each 10 pound increase in body weight represents a five to six pound flushing. And now I'm talking about body weight during in that you know body condition period probably between a a two and let's say a three and a half or a four. Once they get fat real fat, this doesn't hold, but there is an effect of increased body condition or body weight on, on ovulation rate. The true flushing effect, on the other hand, is something we really don't understand, but it's real. Uh, it's an ovulation rate increase, and it, uh, it, it, re it responds to an increase in nutrition. And that increase in nutrition doesn't have to result in, a, in an increase in nutrition status of the U. You. you don't have to move body condition, but it can be a short-term increase. And, and its response is dependent on a lot of things, but it's highly dependent on condition score. And in the right range, it can range from about 5% in use in good condition to 10 
10 to 12 percent in used and poor condition. So if we talk about flushing rate, the, the area of this, the body condition score realm that flushing will have an effect is somewhere about two. If they're, if, if they're below two, they're probably in a worst case scenario to, to live, much less breathe. But if they're two and then up to about three, three and a half, much over three and a half, you generally won't see a flushing effect. So if your ewes are in that area, flushing will darn sure uh, improve your deal. This slide, uh, I'm going to put my pointer here. Can you see my pointer? Uh, this slide, if you look at the red line, you have the average body weight, and that's really that increased reproductive rate uh, for body body condition or body size. I would probably flatten that out a little bit up right about here. Then if we're in this two and a half to three and a half range, we have a flushing effect. And again, I would flatten that curve out a little bit. So what this tells me is flushing will probably not increase the ovulation rate you know, we used to say a good practice is to bring the ewes down to a two and a half so you can flush if they're three and a half. My argument would be leave them in a three and a half, get a little less flushing effect, but you still end up with the, the same number of lambs or maybe a little bit more by not moving them around. Okay, the, the, the key things about flushing is it doesn't take much time. The true flushing response, and there's a lot of old work, says that 14 days before the animal is bred is all you have to go go back. And I think there's some more recent work that says it may be two or three days. But all the old data that I have where they did seven weeks, 14 days, uh, flushing, you know, it doesn't do you any more good to start a month than two weeks before the breeding. So my recommendation for flushing is to begin about two weeks prior to breeding and go into breeding two to three weeks. The sheep cycle is 17 days. So after two to three weeks, every sheep should have had the opportunity to be bred. So that flushing period doesn't have to be very long. Okay, mature ewes respond to flushing better than uh, yearlings and, and let ewe lambs. So, yeah, I'd go ahead and flush my yearlings and ewe lambs, but recognize that mature ewes respond more. Now, as we go through these practices, there we have never broken out the differences between wool sheep and, and other sheep or different types of sheep. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's mainly a function of nutrients. Uh, the nutrients are required, and, and we, we have seen in our studies that there are some differences between individual sheep, uh, but these represent the averages of all, all things and all, all sheep, so, and, and we've never really been able to separate the nutrient requirements for wool versus regular or uh, non-wool sheep. So, so wool's nutrient requirements probably don't add a whole lot. Uh, meat sheep, okay. Uh, works better, flushing works better early and late in the breeding season. Breeding season is, in most parts of the country, is, is November, mid of the breeding season is November. Uh, so if you're trying to breed now, it works. If you're trying to breed late in the season, Christmas time, uh, flushing will also work. Also, there's some things that you can do, like put the rams close to the ewes a cycle before you're going to breed, if you're going to breed early and late. That, that really works. 
uh, recognizing that those ewes right now are just entering the breeding season. Okay, flushing really works better in, in low or poor ewes. We get over three, it, it, it kind of works a little bit, and you get over a condition score about three and a half, and you will not see probably a flushing response. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit. Jay? Jay, are you there? Yeah. What do you Why don't need? you switch to read now? And okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the questions we had since we're right at the breeding season is how do you, you know, about it, uh, you and heat, how do you notice use and heat and those kind of things? And, and recognize now, depending on where you are, you're probably moving just now into the breeding season. So those animals are are anestrous during the summer months, so they're just now starting to breed. So you may just be on that edge. The other thing is you don't see, unless you introduce the ram, ewes are pretty subtle in their estrus, so you generally don't see a lot in activity in those ewes. Uh, but when you introduce a ram and you have very many, uh, the cycle is 17 days, so so about two out of 17 ewes will be in heat at any certain, but one to two out of every 17 ewes should be in heat any, any, any given day once they're starting cycling. And they're in, in heat for, oh, 10 to 24 hours, so you should be able to see some activity on the ram. You've got a single ram, there's some things you can do. You can, there, most of the places sell marking harnesses that you can put on the breast of the ram, and it's a it's a crayon that marks those ranch sheep, and you can kind of notice when they're bred. Okay, Reed, you can have it. All right, thanks, Rodney. Um, Rodney's kind of giving me the task to to look at early pregnancy nutrition. Um, I'm trying to get my slides going here to flip off. Uh, this first, first graph just kind of gives you an idea of the relative size of the lamb and the relative change in size of the lamb during the first part of pregnancy up until 90 days. Um, and actually from 90 days on is whenever we have 90% of fetal growth. So that 90 day representation is still fairly small. Um, I like to keep things fairly simple whenever I think about the stages of pregnancy. And one way to do that is, is use, have a gestation length of 147 days, but I'll say 150 because then I can divide it in by three quite easily. Um, and the first 50 days are very important. We have a lot of things going on and a lot of things that nutrition uh, during this time can have a pretty large impact on. Uh, Rodney was talking to you about flushing, and so flushing is helping get our conception rate up. And that's the first point that we're trying to accomplish is get used to conceive. Uh, we need highly fertile rams using good condition that have been flushed quite well so that we can get the most number of ovulations and potential lambs as we can. But the next thing that we, we need to start thinking about is there's a couple of stages. It's maternal recognition of, play, of pregnancy. Um, which is when that, that young embryo is going to kind of let the you know that it's alive. She's not going to consciously know, but it's going to send a, a, a signal. And we can actually feed the you optimally so that that lamb has the best chance of sending that, sig that signal or multiple lambs sending that signal and not aborting, aborting those embryos or even keeping multiple embryos. Sometimes we do have a fair amount of loss that goes on. Um, so then we have implantation. Implantation is going to occur about 21 days into pregnancy and then after that we have placental develop. And all of that really gets going in the first 50 days. And I'll, I'll reiterate this multiple times through this portion of the segment that I'm going to talk about, but overfeeding and underfeeding during this time can have some very detrimental effects where we can lose more lambs uh, than we really would like to. 
the next 50 days, uh, we don't have a whole lot going on. Uh, there is some more placental development, some angiogenesis, some things that are happening, uh, but the lambs really don't get going until the last 50 days. So that first period, uh, we need to be very, fairly cautious about feeding the ewes and not underfeeding or overfeeding them. Uh, in my first set of slides, I saw or I showed that we need to increase our our level of nutrition to the ewe by 50%. Um, and what we want to do is is present that to the ewes and and get that extra 50%. But we don't want too much of it. One of the problems that we always run into is how do we get that distributed to all of the ewes equally? Um, if we have some ewes that are eating way too much of that feed and some ewes that aren't eating enough of it. Uh, we can have some, some impacts that, that reduce our overall productivity. But some work that, that I had done in my master's level research at New Mexico, we found that there was about a 30% embryonic loss. And whenever I re reviewed the literature for that research project, that's pretty consistent uh, for breeds across the United States and even across the world. We have a fair amount of loss. This 30% is fairly normal. Um, sometimes if it's management's perfect, we may be able to get it down and the environment and other things are, are quite well, we may be able to reduce that loss. Um, but I think that loss is, is fairly even across the industry and uh, some management things may help to reduce it. Uh, one thing that was clear in, in some research that, that I looked into and was kind of a key point of, of that research that we developed that was overfeeding and underfeeding does a couple of things. It alters blood flow to the, to the reproductive tract, which reduces progesterone, which may not be that important to you, but the last point is, is that will increase embryonic loss. And in the studies that they did is they were looking at, if you're feeding you use twice what they need, um, you can accelerate that embryonic loss, or if you're feeding the use half of what they need, you will see loss as well. Uh, before we were talking about presenting the ewes with an extra 50% to get an optimal flush, but if you have a ewe that consumes twice what she's supposed to, we're approaching a level where um, she's eating at two times maintenance and that could uh, potentially increase embryonic loss. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, some other things that can cause embryonic loss is definitely stress. Heat stress is one of the key points if you're breeding in pens that don't have any shade. Uh, if you're breeding in August or, or September this time of year, the heat can really lose, can cause some uh, embryonic loss. So we do want to provide shade and, and uh, wind and some fans and things if we're, if we're breeding use single sire mating in the barns or something along those lines. We also see a fair amount of embryonic loss if ewes are, are predated upon. If we've got coyotes in them or domestic dogs get into the ewes, we can see high embryonic, embryonic loss as well. But that's not specifically related to nutrition. Um, here's one of my favorite graphs whenever I think about feeding ewes during the gestation period. And so again, on the x-axis, it's from day uh, 0 to 150 days of gestation. And then on the y-axis, we have uh, fetal weight on the left side and placental weight on the right. So the orange line shows placental development. And we see that placental development, the majority of it really occurs during the first 50 days. And so there's been some recent research that has shown that if you feed too much or too little, to the U, we can alter that, and that placental doesn't develop properly. Um, it actually will always be smaller if we under or overfeed. And so that placenta is going to feed the lambs. And so if we impact it early, um, we can't feed the U properly later on in gestation to get those lambs to grow well. So the yellow line is the growth of the lamb. Um, it's in kilograms, but, but you can basically multiply by two and get that uh, the relative numbers for yourself, but you see in the last 50 days or so, we have about 90% of the fetal growth occurs late. Um, but that has to be done beforehand by developing that placenta well. So we need to really target our feeding so that we feed the ewes what they need when they need it. Because again, overfeeding and underfeeding during this placental development period, again, restricts blood flow and will reduce birth weight of the lambs. Uh, we may see some embryonic or fetal loss, uh, but late birth weight lambs are also uh, some of our highest uh, death rate lambs. So some of our most neonatal losses come from light lambs. Uh, so again, just kind of reiterate, uh, reiterate this. The management strategies that you need to do during this early pregnancy period is avoid unnecessary activity. 
Uh, we really don't want to be running the use in and vaccinating or, or deworming or anything that's going to have activity that's going to stress the use, cause the use to go off feed or anything. You know, so we want them nice, uh, calm, feeding them the, the appropriate amount and, uh, and really avoid drastic changes in nutrition or body composition. So just really feed them what they need and that's about it. So during that mid-pregnancy period, uh, so again that you know the latter part of those first 50 days or even the first part of the next 50 days, again don't under or overfeed the ewes because that placenta is still developing, it's still growing, it's still developing. Um, that's all that's going to end up feeding and supplying nutrients to the lamb and we want that to develop properly. The other point of placenta that's very, that's very important to the lamb, not only for growth and birth weight, but that placenta produces progesterone. And the larger that placenta is and the more blood flow that we have to it, the more progesterone that it's going to produce. Progesterone is the hormone of pregnancy and it also stimulates the number of, um, you know, the, the mammary glands or the number of lactating cells that develop. So if we feed properly during that time, we can uh, go ahead and develop an, a bigger, fuller udder that's going to produce more milk so that those lambs are even going to uh, grow and be healthier later on. So it's very important during that early and mid-pregnancy period to really target our feed resources to the ewes at what they need. So one of the problems that we, that we have, you know, we, we commonly think of having ewes under condition uh, and and needing to feed and pick up the nutrients that, that or supply extra nutrients to get those ewes in the body condition that we need and get an optimal flush and, and uh, get them to grow those lambs and be healthy enough to, to supply a lactation. But we also have over-conditioned ewes. And over-conditioned ewes can be on the heavy side and they can have light lambs and may not produce as much milk because they're over-conditioned. And so we commonly get the question, well, how much is over-conditioned and how do I pull that off? And roughly, we can factor in that you can normally lose, lose four to five pounds during the wintering period or during that gestation period without affecting those lambs too much. But we cannot afford that use to lose any more than 10 to 12 pounds. If they're losing a lot of body condition during that time, uh, the lambs may not be as big or the you may be metabol or meta she starts to liberate all that fat and muscle and that you may go into uh, metabolic ketosis or the twin lamb disease and we lose the ewe and the lambs because she's losing too much. So we would recommend that you would not have her lose too much, during, too much weight during that winter period and just uh, let her milk it off her back after you know, she's in that mid-lactation period. So uh, again, ewes that are over-conditioned, uh, or ewes that are entering the winter in good condition, we just can't afford to lose too much weight. We'll leave that for the summer and let her lactate it off. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Lisa, who's going to talk to you about uh, testing your forage samples so that we know what feed's available uh, to be fed to the ewes. Lisa? Okay, while, while we're going there, uh, one of one of the things we one of the things we didn't see is uh, we didn't talk about earlier in the flushing, and I thought about it is how do you flush and what do you flush with? Uh, and there's been a lot of research on that, and most of the research says that. Know, you can flush with protein and or energy, uh, one or the other or both, and you don't have to feed very much, something like a third of a pound. Uh, in some cases, if they're poor, a quarter of a pound of, of a grain will get it done or a, a pellet or something like that. So you don't have to really change the sheep, but you don't don't have to feed very much. The other thing that, that a lot of people ask is, okay, I've already got my ewe lambs on grain, should I flush? And probably not because you're already pushing them and they're already moving in a positive direction. So so an extra, you know, if they're already moving positively and you're feeding them the gain weight, 
then you add a little bit more won't just just a little bit more won't create that flushing effect. So I wouldn't change anything on those ewe lambs. I'd just keep them moving and, and try to feed them. Uh, you know, ewe lambs are tough. Uh, depending on what kind of ewe lambs you have to get bred, rule of thumb is they have to be at least 80% of the mature body weight. Uh, if you have some thin or some highly productive type genetics in it, uh, maybe 70% of mature body weight at breeding time to breed. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa. One of the one of the topics we had is with drought. What do we do, and how do we make this work? And and I think probably one of the mo most important things is you can shoot bull, and until you test it, you don't know what you're feeding. Well, thanks, Rodney. Um, I just want to move through these slides fairly quickly with you. Um, I think a lot of this is, is common sense, but it just needs to be re-emphasized. You know, much of the country is experiencing uh, drought this year, and certainly under those conditions, I can't, I, I, I can't emphasize enough that you need to test your forage samples. You need to, you need to find out what you're working with. We may be using um, some different types of feed than we're, than we're used to, and certainly those non-traditional forages or non-traditional feeds um, can vary greatly in, in uh, nutrient content. So I think it's worth um, certainly looking at that. Um, in order to capitalize on you know, using those feeds economically and making sure that you only use what you need, I highly, again, recommend that you use forage testing. And I'm going to give you a slide coming up on your screen shortly that really um, is a laboratory report from Midwest Labs. Um, this is one of the testing labs that is commonly used in the U.S. Uh, certainly there are others. But I want you to focus in on this um, particular uh, report. We're looking at, you know, you want to make sure that you have a good idea of crude protein. Again, like Reed discussed, it's giving it to you in a percent, and really when you're, when you're turning around and feeding it, you're feeding it in an amount. So you kind of need to, to be able to figure that out. Uh, another item that you want to focus in on is TDN, or total digestible nutrients. It gives you an estimate of energy. Those are the main things that you're going to focus on on this laboratory report. But in years like this, I think it's really worth looking at testing for nitrate. And especially if some of your forages are under uh, severe drought conditions, this is a prime uh, reason that some of these forages will um, accumulate nitrate. And nitrate can be um, extremely toxic. Uh, sheep are fairly tolerant when compared to other species like cattle, but I still think that it is very valuable in testing. Some of our forages that we may be using this year, for instance, corn stalks. We've, we've heard a number of reports that corn stalks have been found to be accumulating nit nitrate because of the drought conditions. Um, you can look on this report and you know it gives you an estimate in terms of nitrate in percent. Um, a lot of your recommendations might be in parts per million or PPN. This report gives you 0.08%, which is 800 parts per million. Generally, that would be a safe forage for all classes and all uh, livestock species. If, you're, if you dive up into a, a higher range than that, it, those forages might not be safe for pregnant animals. Um, you can see some sloughing of fetus if you get into um, situations where you get high nitrate. I may have missed the boat um, on this next part of the talk, but I really felt it was kind of important to talk a little bit about weaning management. And I know uh, some of you farm flock operators, this is long since over and you're moving on already in the breeding uh, season. 
um, already much farther beyond this. But I think it is worth re-emphasizing that uh, careful weaning management requires planning. This isn't a, an activity that you know you and your spouse decide one day after coffee that you're going to go ahead and wean lambs that day. This requires some thought process in order to do it effectively and prevent some uh, or avoid some added stress and disease with your sheep. You can begin, um, you know, in, in for intensive operations, we may be looking at weaning lambs as early as 50 to 60 days. For most of our extensive or forage-based operations, we're talking, we're talking that we're, we're probably more like uh, four to five months of age, and that would be where we would be in the West with some of our forage-based operations. So that's kind of why I was interested in, in kind of covering a little bit. Uh, the main focus of our, our kind of our careful planning is to avoid mastitis problems. And in, and in weaning done properly, you can avoid a lot of problems, especially in these highly productive, high milking ewes, if you take the time to begin the process in a, in a kind of a stepwise fashion. Something to keep in mind is that, you know, ewes with bad udders basically have decreased or no production potential for future years, and they have very little salvage value. So if we can prevent mastitis, um, I think it's very worthwhile, very worth our time. So we're going to focus on a, you know, a little bit on early weaning program. Um, we're needing to shut down uh, milk production in the ewe. We want to lower the crude protein, lower the energy content of that diet, and sometimes we can even use um, water intake or water management in those sheep to reduce uh, some problems as well. Early weaning program, grain feeding should certainly, if they're in a, in a grain feeding situation, you should start to reduce that and then basically eliminate it before weaning. Again, the idea of reducing the protein and energy content of the diet. We start reducing again the, the hay quality up to three to four days before weaning and then right before weaning we really should be focusing in on feeding them a, a, a low protein or a, a poor quality uh, type forage like straw or poor quality hay or low quality hay in order to again really begin the process of shutting down milk production. I think it's a good idea to leave the ewes in a dry lot situation on continuing on that low quality feed until their udders have, have begun to dry up. And that basically um, typically will take up to a week's period of time. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we can uh, do to prevent mastitis is to is to keep those ewes in that situation and not turn back out, especially in our farm flock operations where we're talking about we're still grazing green pastures, unlike what we are in the West where we have basically a pretty dried up situation out here and, and we don't necessarily have to worry about that. But just don't turn your ewes out onto pasture immediately after removing them from the lambs. So that kind of concludes um, my aspect on, on early weaning, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Rodney here, and I think we're going to begin uh, probably some questions now. Yeah, let's, let's kind of, Jay, I think we'll start the questions, but one of, one of the things, one of the questions that came in is about weaning and weaning management and so forth. And you need to remember and read, pipe in if you, that peak lactation occurs in about three to four weeks after lambing. And then it's downhill, and by a couple months, lactation is not very much. So if your ewes are still, lambs are still on their ewes at three to four, or 120 days of age, three to four weeks, yeah, they're more of a companion animal than lactation, and you could just pull them off probably and not have a major issue. Uh, those ewes are basically you know, by, by 120 to 140 days, the majority of them probably aren't lactating very high, and so you don't have any problems. Uh, one of them talked about breeding ewes and, and breeding ewes during lactation. Uh, we generally 
don't think of that as much of a problem uh, because of the seasonal anesthesis of use. Uh, if you're breeding in the non asterisk period, you probably want those ewes lambed and, and people have taken the ewes, the lambs off for a period of time because it's difficult to get those ewes bred anyway during the anesthesis period. Uh, but generally those ewes are, are bred or uh, are, are not really lactating by the time lambing comes around, especially if you lamb in the spring and then breed in the fall like is a typical operation. Uh, they will conceive while nursing, but a lot of the programs call for pulling them off for a period of time. Uh, wormers during pregnancy. Uh, there's a lot of anthematics that are safe during pregnancy. Uh, they should say on the label, but there is quite a few of them. Uh, the one that, that I can't think of the name right now, one of them is not safe for the first 45 days after you breed. Uh, causes some problems, but follow the label direction and, and there is certainly a battery of wormers that are available uh, during uh, pregnancy. I've been kind of reading down the questions and hopefully I've got to them. So Jay, do we have any more questions? Yeah, you guys did. First of all, thank you to the speakers not only for their presentation for doing a but for doing an excellent job of addressing these questions uh, that were both submitted ahead of time or during the presentations. Um, Valerie in um, New York submitted a question about um, increased needs for the use having twins. We often see. Um, the nutrition requirements given uh, differently for those that have singles versus twins and she's wondering about breeds like fin sheep that have several more lambs than twins quite often. Is there a formula for going up beyond having twins that people can uh, refer to? I think read the new NRC goes to triplets I think doesn't it? Okay. I haven't got read. I was getting off unmute. Uh, yes, it does. It, it does have requirements uh, for greater than for greater than two lambs. Uh, we didn't present those today in that graph, uh, just to kind of keep things simple. But yes, it does go above okay. uh, two lambs. And and they just ratchet up, and especially during lactation, uh, you know, for multiple lambs, it becomes more critical, especially that those ewes are in very good condition at lambing time. You know, move positive and so forth. Now, the, the nutrient requirements for those multiple birth ewes are probably that, not that much increased at the, the stages, the first third and the second third of pregnancy that we were talking about, but they just explode during the last third of pregnancy. Okay, and Lisa addressed Steve's question out of Ohio, I think, somewhat with the corn stalks. He asked, are corn stalks good enough to overwinter use and how many acres per ewe? Um, you want to address that anymore, it, Lisa? I, I think that, that, you know, corn stalks probably work better in the dry ewe. Uh, I, would, I would be concerned with corn stalks. I, I'm not familiar with it. Reed, you might want to address that. But my concern, you know, we don't have very much corn in Montana, but my concern would be that you really need to watch body condition on those ewes, and, and they probably do need a protein supplement. Uh, probably a 33 to, you know, in our, in, our, in, our, in our range conditions where the, where the you know, protein can be low, you want to make sure you have that six to eight percent protein in the diet, so you feed those rumen microbes. So maybe, maybe a little protein supplement would be helpful. Read what? Yeah, um, yeah. I would, I would reiterate that. I mean, a lot of that I would say is it's going to take a good shepherd uh, to turn out the ewes on on corn stalks. You need to know 
what stage of gestation they are. Um, I'm assuming that this time of year is going to be after they were bred. So if you're in that middle part of gestation, uh, it may work pretty well, especially if there's some other things, if they're picking up cobs and some uh, miscellaneous corn kernels that didn't get harvested in and around. And so I would watch the condition of the ewes, uh, make sure that, that they're, they're looking full and healthy. Uh, the one concern with that, especially this year in drought conditions, is those nitrates do accumulate more in the stalks. So if you're forcing the use to eat the stalks and that's the only thing left, we could run into some problems there. Or uh, the corn stover is being fed in, in a lot of ewe diets, especially when we get more into the Midwest area because it's one of the few uh, forage products that's around. And again, it needs to be balanced. Um, there are some nutrients there. Uh, they may be able to fed to use if they're processed properly and we're, we're feeding. They can consume enough and it's digestible enough to meet their requirements. I would concur with Reed about the nitrate accumulating in the stock. Um, one thing also to keep in mind is typically those nitrates will not leach out. So if, if those stocks are high in nitrate, that's going to take some um, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult for that to leave the plant, even if it's dried up, and um, it's still going to be of concern. Okay, very good. Um, I'm, we have some more questions being typed in, but I want to go to Christy in uh, Michigan. You've had your hand up patiently. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, Christy, and you can go ahead and ask your question uh, directly to the uh, presenters, if it will unmute here. Are you there, Christy? I'm not getting anything here. Um, so let's go back to some of the questions. Lisa made a recommendation in the days of age to wean in extensive situations, and somebody was asking for you to repeat that, Lisa. I think that that's typically in that four to five month range. Uh, Rodney mentioned, you know, 120 to 140 days of age. I think that's fairly typical of our uh, extensive forage-based, um, kind of more of our western range operations. Um, I think that's that's fairly consistent that we're, you know, we're lambing in April and we're weaning in, in uh, you know, typically in August or September. Yeah, kind of the earliest, you know, there's a lot of people in, in Reed's part of the country that wean as early as 21 days. and You really have to do some management to get that to happen. You know, kind of the rule of thumb that we've always used is 60 days or 45 pounds and weaning can go pretty easy. Up to, you know, that the range situations wean, you know, whenever they sell. We we have a purebred operation and we wean now because if we don't, the bucks will start breeding some buck lambs will start breeding some ewes. So, you know, typically we're not going to breed the ewes till November. So it could be, a, you know, weaning is, is, there's no right or wrong answer what fits into your management system. Yeah, Rodney, I would just add to that. I don't know that we have anybody down at 21 days, but there are some that will wean as early as 34 days in a group and so they'll they would lamb for a period of time uh, and then isolate those lambs together and if the youngest one was at about 34 days they would wean um, but that would be before then on the ewes would go on to a really really low quality feed for at least a week um, and that'll the ewes will be dried up quite a bit, and it drives the lambs when the ewes aren't lactating to the creep, and then you can wean lambs early if they're on creep. But if they are not on a uh, creep feed, it would be it would be tough to get the lambs to do do well if you weren't on a situation where you had creep feed and you could get the ewes to dry up uh, with a real low quality feed. Okay. Typically, that's when. I think a lot of the corn stalks are used during that dry period. Uh, 
you know, I darn sure if I was using them, I think going back to that previous question, I think I might at least feed a third of a pound of a protein supplement. Yeah. Say a third of a pound of a twenty percent supplement a day, and you can feed it every other day, two thirds of a pound every other day. And CRP has been available for putting up as hay, and that's also a good uh, feed source to feed use to get them to dry up uh, in a dry lot period. It's enough to keep them keep them going, but they're not going to produce much milk. Okay. Um, we also have a question from uh, RJ here, and he asks, we have some sheep that are only on pasture that are fat to obese. How do we slim them down? Um, my recommendation is, is there an ability to pull the ewes into a dry lot um, area for a period of time so that they uh, can't be grazing any longer? Uh, sometimes whenever ewes are in a maintenance period and we're feeding ewes um, with round bell feeders so they kind of have full access to it, so this is kind of a similar analogy for constant grazing, you can feed ewes um, that are in a maintenance period for uh, less than two hours a day is all that they need access to that. So my recommendation, depending on where they were in gestation, we don't want them losing too much weight if they're during the breeding period, um, but just restricting their access uh, to that grass would be my recommendation to reduce body condition. Yeah, I think, I think that's what I was thinking of. Only let them graze for a little bit a day. Now, you want to be one of the things that kind of through this seminar. If they're bred, you want to be pretty careful at jerking them back down. You might have to live with fat ewes through lactation, you know, through lambing, which is going to be a problem, but you don't want to make drastic changes with pregnant ewes. Okay, we have a question from the Pacific Northwest uh, where they have an abundance of pumpkins in October. They want to know, are pumpkins a good source of feed for early pregnancy? <laughs> Rodney, how come you're not piping and, up? And while pumpkins? you're addressing that, somebody else asked about apples. Why don't you go on and I will... We're pulling out a book out of the archive. To be okay. We have There's apples and pumpkins are the two... Uh, that's something that, that you definitely would want to take and look. Uh, one thing that we may not have mentioned or stressed well enough uh, in our presentation is in the sheep industry handbook and the NRC guide there is uh, a, a table of feedstuffs and so they'll give you the energy content, the protein content, the the minerals and the vitamins for normal feedstuffs. I'm not sure pumpkins are going to be in that feedstuff value uh, but that information is probably out there and so the first thing that you would want to look at is what's the energy content or probably the first thing was the moisture content and then see if there's been any problems. So I don't know if I've delayed long enough that Rodney's got the I've actually found there. it in the book. Okay. Well, I don't know. Uh, let's see here. You know, this talks a little bit about the seeds, um, you know, being high in oil and can be fed to livestock, especially, well, this says especially pigs, but um, hulls and oil meal can be fed to livestock. Um, Why don't you go on with another question? Jay, get one response from somebody that said that they are a great source of vitamin C and lots of energy. Um, so apparently somebody has some experience with the pumpkins. Yeah. The only other thing that I would comment on that is they're only 9% dry matter. Uh, so there's a, quite a bit of moisture in there and uh, some of that may cause diarrhea and some of it they may not be able to consume enough of with that much moisture content to get uh, the amount of nutrients that they need. And so that would just probably be a little bit of a trial and error to put out and weigh out the amount of feed that you're putting out and see how much can the ewes consume in a day on a daily basis? Okay. Yeah, I, I think those feeds that are high in in uh, 
moisture, you just have to see how much they eat. Okay. Uh, we have an excellent question from Dee. She says, if you test your hay and don't use it all in one year, how much does hay change in the course of a year when well stored, dry and dark? I my gut, if you test it and it's well preserved, it should preserve pretty good. It should be pretty close. I know most of the issue, there, there was some work where they covered it and didn't cover it. And it lost some very quickly, but not, you know, after it's stored well. Reed, you got that. Lisa, you're the forage person. No, I, I, would, I would agree. I don't think you need to uh, worry about testing it again. And as long as it's covered and stored well, where you're not getting any rain on it, I don't think you need to worry about too much decrease in nutrient content. Okay. Any info on you feeding for fetal programming that is effects on offspring performance later in their lives? Uh, Reed has come from the fetal programming center of the world there. Um, Without having a lot of that literature in front of me, I don't know that I have too much to discuss. Uh, there's quite a bit of research going on looking at the fetal programming. Uh, there's been some really good research on the on the beef cattle uh, area as well and sheep. And there's some interesting things uh, that 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 come to light that if we if we do feed at an optimum level, a level uh, especially what maybe our NRC requirements would would predict. Um, our offspring are the most productive, but sometimes uh, if the ewes are restricted, uh, say maybe 80% of what the NRC, they may be preset to be more efficient over their lives. Um, so there's always a give and take with it, and so without a, a more specific question, I don't know exactly what the what this question is relating to, but yes, there's there's quite a bit of things that happen, and a lot of it's related to epigenetics, which is this study kind of of how our genetics are expressed differently depending on how on what the environment that we were exposed to in utero and after parturition. Uh, from a wool point of view, a lot of wool follicles are developing in your secondary primary during that early stages. So, you know, good nutrition is important. I don't think we know how to modify it past good nutrition. We're pretty positive that the poor nutrition probably is not going to do a very good, not going to help them any. Uh, so, you know, I think if you follow kind of the, the footprint that we had here, uh, you're going to follow the best that we know about right now. Uh, we may change, you know, with some ideas as we know more. And my guess is some of the fetal imprinting may be more mineral oriented than, than just the major nutrients like protein and energy. You there, Jay? Mm, sorry. <laughs> had my microphone muted and didn't realize. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions, a little bit off topic, but um, one of them was somebody was asking about vaccinations pre-lambing. Do you guys have a quick list that you can just uh, provide that? Yeah, I, I, I believe that the two, well, the, the several things that we look at, at least in Montana, and then I'll let Reed, Reed talk about it, you know, we, we do uh, overeating or, or enterotoxemia, and we usually give type C and D, give it to the ewes uh, to, that, to support the lambs, so you two doses the first year and then an annual booster afterwards. Uh, pre Sometime around that period, we also vaccinate for vibrios, vibrio. 
and Vibrio is different in sheep than it is in cattle, so you want the sheep vaccine. Read what yeah, you guys I, 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 I don't have much to add to that. Um, we definitely recommend that, that sheep producers give a an overeating vaccine to the ewes anywhere from two weeks to a month before lambing so that those antibodies are passed to the lamb uh, through the colostrum. And then, then we can booster the lambs a little bit later on and they probably have a better protection by getting that initial booster from the ewe. Uh, you know, similarly, we have vibriosis or Campylobacter. Uh, we would vaccinate for if you have flock history of that. Um, there is also a vaccine out for chlamydia. Uh, some don't like its efficacy and, and haven't used it. Uh, but those are probably the primary vaccines that are given to sheep. Uh, the only other one that I would say that that may be given, and I wouldn't give it uh, pre-lambing, was if you have any any cases of caseous lymphadenitis, there's a vaccine that's that's fairly effective against that disease as yeah, well. Yeah, some of those like the chlamydia vaccine, we have a vet here and he recommends you give it in the evening because that way you're sleeping while the sheep are, are limping around a little bit and then they'll be okay in the morning. Because mm -hmm. it, it does lame them or it does stiff them up sometimes, some of the some some of those. Okay, we got a couple of questions on the rams. Um, body, what a body condition score for rams prior to breeding? Um, any recommendations there? I think you want them a three and a half. You know, if you buy them at a sale, they'll be fives, <laughs> and they'll prob you'll probably do okay, and they'll melt a little bit on you, but it's probably okay. But I don't think you want them going into lambing much under three and a half, or going into breeding much under three and a half, maybe three read? Yeah, I, I would say that three to four range. Um, sometimes when we talk about body condition score, one person's is a little bit different than the other. Uh, we don't want a lot of fat on a ram, uh, just because they tend to be a little bit lazier, um, and not get around quite as good, so we don't want anything that's, you know, four four or above four, uh, but but some of their, they definitely need to be in a body condition three, uh, but some of that's going to depend on the ram and, and the breeds kind of are a little bit different and they carry fat in different places. That was one of the questions about the nutrient requirements from a hair sheep and, and wool sheep and um, that kind of brought up the idea that that hair sheep typically keep keep fat in a different spot, and so when they get better condition down their back, they have may have a lot more internally. So some of that's going to kind of go back to to some experience that you've had with rams working or not. I think the biggest thing is I if they're in a body condition three or better, I'm happy. But uh, I like to watch the vigor uh, or the libido of rams. I think that's probably one of the most important things that people don't put that much emphasis on, they can really improve uh, the number of lambs that are born if the ram really has a lot of vigor, gets around, checks a lot of use, and some of that goes with group pinning, whereas if you have one ram in a pen, he doesn't have any competition. So. And long, we had somebody ask a clarification question on uh, what is meant by putting the rams close to the ewes to help cycling. I thought it was best to remove the rams and then bring them back. Yeah, there's some work in North Dakota that says if you remove the rams and bring bring them back, you remove them all the way. But a lot of people will put them right next to in the fence next to them, you know. But you need a pretty good fence for one cycle before they breed. Yeah, there's a number of people in our area that also use uh, teaser rams or vasectomized rams. And so what they're trying to do is make sure that all the ewes are cycling. Uh, we see that most effective in out-of-season breeding or, you know, or even into August and September. And so I think what Rodney was trying to get out there is if you expose the ewes to the rams, they'll cycle, and they tend to always be more prolific that second or maybe even third cycle, uh, some work that, that Hudson Glimp did and they were looking at, at ovulation rate throughout the year and it definitely was a lot better 
in, in October compared to August in the same group of animals just because they've had more time to cycle. So if we can get them exposed to those rams uh, and get the ewes cycling, uh, we tend to get a better conception rate and a more uh, or a higher number of lambs born than if we just turn the rams out right away and they start breeding that first cycle. Yeah, so if you put them right, actually in the pan next to your ewes, say, and the first cycle be 17 days, so two weeks to three weeks, maybe even four weeks before you turn out, turn them out. But before you do that, go up and nail the fence down because if it's not a good fence, they'll be in with the ewes. And then you'll be lambing an extra month. But the question was correct because if you, if you don't have ram isolation from the ewes prior to breeding season, the ram effect does not work as well. Yeah. Okay, we've got one more question, and I'll, I'll combine a couple of people's questions here. Um, distiller grains and corn silage, um, people are asking about those as a good source of feed, uh, specifically um, feeding to ewe lambs versus feeding um, to older ewes. And then on distiller's grains, a question was asked about the risk of molds there. you guys want to address anything with those two feed sources? Uh, distillers grains, uh, there's quite a bit of work that research is done here at NDSU, uh, particularly looking at dried distillers grains on lambs, um, and they, they do, do really well. The one main concern uh, was brought up was molds, and the other one would be sulfur. Uh, for feeding a lot of distillers grains, sulfur uh, can be a problem, and we can see some polio in lambs and ewes. Uh, wet distillers, we do have some mold problems. Um, it can look kind of ugly. I, I haven't fed it directly, but I have seen some literature that they've fed some of that moldy stuff to beef cows without any problems. Um, there could be some concerns to feeding them to pregnant ewes and those molds causing abortion. So that may be of a concern, especially if it's in that early part of gestation uh, for distillers. Um, but the, a big thing about distillers is you, you get a lot of variation from lot to lot and so uh, and, and from one plant to another. Uh, so we would recommend to test those uh, and understand you know what the what the energy content, what the sulfur level is. Um, as far as silage goes, uh, silage typically is about 35 percent dry matter, so we're somewhere in the range of 65 percent water. And that's the only main restriction for silage is can the ewes eat enough of it to meet their nutrient requirements. It's a great feed um, as long as the ewes can just physically eat enough to meet the requirements uh, for their stage of production. Okay, very good. And we have one last housekeeping thing. Uh, somebody has requested uh, slide number five with the body condition scoring. Uh, is that available anywhere um, that people can access that information to practice? I, which one slide number five? I, I, it's the I one with the body condition scores across it? Yeah, the, where, you, where you're across the production cycle and you have the red line that went across the threes essentially. Yeah. So, uh, we're, we're bringing it up again. Um, We can put all these slides up. Okay. And we can work yeah, with... Certainly if there's an interest in, in putting them up, you know, we can give Jay access to them and, and he can put them, the corresponding slideshow with the, with the, uh, trans, you know, the transcript of this webinar. Yeah. Okay. Well, that would be good, and I, I uh, want to thank all of our presenters here tonight. You guys did an excellent job and answered a lot of questions, and uh, greatly appreciated that. Um, once again, we want to thank the American Sheep Industry and the uh, uh, National Sheep Industry Improvement Center for uh, making this uh, program possible. Um, without their funding support and, and whatnot, we couldn't uh, have done this this evening. We thank all of you guys for attending. We had really good at attendance tonight. Uh, the recording will be uh, available to you. We'll be sending out an email to all attendees in the next few days with a link to that. 
And again, you can go through the ASI website at sheepusa.org and look at the Rebuild the Sheep Industry uh, materials, and we'll have a link in there also uh, that you can access it. And it sounds like we'll have some of the slides up there also for you to view. So thank you all for attending tonight. And with that, I'll go ahead and bring this to a close.